Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to Live from the Les Aspen Center. My name is Christopher Murray. I'm on the faculty here at the Les Aspen Center. And on behalf of our director, Father Tim O'Brien, um, our students, uh, our alums, and all supporters, uh, I want to welcome you to this wonderful event this afternoon uh, with uh, Professor Charles Franklin of the Market University Law School poll to present uh, his recent uh, results of his new poll on the United States Supreme Court. Um, we are literally standing uh, five blocks uh, east of the, of the Supreme Court, uh, and so this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to talk about Professor Franklin's findings uh, and the relevance to the current events with uh, the nomination of Judge Jackson uh, to the United States Supreme Court. Um, I want to uh, thank Professor Franklin for being here with us, um, and to all of you who are watching, uh, thank you for your support of this program and of the Aspen Center and of Marquette University. Charles? Thank you, Chris. It's uh, good to see you again. Good to be back here. And uh, let me see if I can get all my gadgets to work here, which, of course, is not quite working. Well, this will be a short presentation if, uh, there we go. Just have to be patient with these things. Um, thanks for y'all for coming. Uh, I'm really pleased to be back here at the Aspen Center, uh, which I think is one of Marquette's great centers for bringing our students to DC, exposing them to the work of the many government and nonprofit and business institutions here in the city and to teach them also more academic perspectives as well. Um, I've always enjoyed my interactions with the Aspen students and maybe especially those who've returned to Milwaukee uh, with a noticeably deeper understanding of government and society. It's been a, a real pleasure to work with those um, Aspen alumni. Um, the work that Father O'Brien and, and Chris Murray do here prepares our students to uh, for what comes next, whatever that may be. Uh, and we should all thank them for that and thank the founders and supporters of the Aspen Center for this treasure for Marquette and for our students. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be here in DC in person. Uh, COVID has forced us to miss way too many in-person events and it's, uh, it's hope nice to be coming past that time. In Milwaukee, the home of the Marquette Law School poll is the Lubar Center, which is both a large lecture hall and sometimes courtroom in Eckstein Hall, the law school. Uh, but it's also the Lubar Center for Public Policy and Civic Education, which supports our many on the issues programs, um, which are events that host topics on politics, pu public policy and society. Um, and our ongoing research on this year, redistricting, the, the Milwaukee housing market and uh, turnover in housing ownership and evictions and other things, deep dives into the 2020 census as we learn about what changes in the population in Wisconsin and in Milwaukee are going on. <coughs> also, many issues of education at both the state and the national level. Um, <coughs> and our, the work we do on uh, water law and, and water policy, which is also an issue, not just in Wisconsin, but it is especially an issue in Wisconsin. For two years, we've been unable to gather in person at the Lubar Center for those events, uh, usually with around 240 friends and attendees in the, in the Lubar Center there, but we have high hopes of being able to return to in-person programs, which have always been at the heart of, of what we do in our programming for the center. Um, but it's nice to be here and in person and uh, kicking off a return to uh, live event. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna mostly talk about the survey that we just released at 6 a.m. this morning on the U.S. Supreme Court. This is a national survey of public opinion about the court and both uh, Judge Jackson, but also um, other issues facing the court. 
Let me just tell you the background of the poll. First of all, it's a national interview with uh, respondents from all 50 states. 1,004 adults were sampled. We interviewed people March 14th through the 24th. And that includes some set of interviews that were conducted before the Jackson hearings were started in the Senate and some after those hearings began. And I'll mention that as we go. Um, and we interview these folks through a random sample of addresses around the country, and then people complete the survey online, which is the new modern way of doing surveys. Phones are still being used. We use them in our Wisconsin surveys, but for the national surveys, this combination of address-based sampling, so every mailing address in the country gets a known chance to be selected into the sample, uh, but then the uh, efficiency of completing surveys online is the second part of it. But it's a random sample of the population, not a sample of volunteers who just say, ooh, I'd like to do a survey. Uh, you have to be sampled to be in the survey in the first place. And you can only do it once. So you don't get to vote 20 times in the survey. Um, this is part of an ongoing project at the law school of surveys about the US Supreme Court that we do six times a year, every other month now. And we're doing this to monitor the court at a time of transition in the court, a period when the court is addressing a number of major cases before it with the potential to change public policy in important ways or legal policy in important ways, or maybe not. We'll find out by July 1st what, just what decisions the court will reach. Um, but the role of public opinion and the court is a kind of complicated one, and I think I have to explain just a bit. In asking the public what they think about the court or about court cases, we're not asking the public to be lawyers who are deeply enmeshed in the precedents and the law and past decisions. But I think if anything we've learned over the last few years, maybe the last few decades, that the court is centrally involved in politics and the political life of the country. And even if the court wants to be removed from that, the fact that the Senate must confirm justices and presidents must make nominations, all of that, and that the public cares about what the court does and what the outcomes are. All of those are reasons why public opinion matters. Not to judge whether the court made the right decision or the wrong decision, but the public does have a role in a democracy to play in this. And we're trying to capture that and, and what the public thinks about the outcomes that we see. So that's the rationale for why we're doing these surveys and why we're doing them as frequently as we are because when decisions come down or when cases are accepted, those become news events. And as this new vacancy on the court um, shows, you also don't know when there will be a new nominee and we can capture that. So that's the... Um, process that we're going there. And we have an excited, uh, enthusiastic audience participant in the dog. So if the uh, if you hear an occasional bark, that's because a very good boy wanted to say something. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the results that we found in this survey that we just did. So the survey was entirely after um, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson was nominated. And as I say, most of the interviews about 800 were done before the hearings and a little under 200 were completed after the hearings began. Um, so the top line number here is that she has quite strong support for confirmation. 66% say that if they were senators, they would vote to confirm her. 33% would oppose her. And on qualification grounds, 46% see her as very qualified, 42% somewhat qualified, just 12% say she's not qualified. Um, and support also varies by party in these polarized times. It won't surprise you that there's a party gap. But with that, 29% of Republicans support her confirmation, 71% are opposed. 
But by two to one, 67 to 32, independents support the confirmation. With Democrats, it's nearly unanimous, 95 to five. So we see a, a nominee in a very strong position for confirmation in the public side at this point. <clears throat> what role the hearings play, we get a little taste of that. Of those interviewed before the hearing started, 64% supported her confirmation. Of those interviewed after the hearings began, 72% supported. So there's a small but noticeable uh, eight-point increase in support after the hearings began. And likewise, views of her qualifications went up from 44% before the hearings to 52% after they uh, began. So um, whatever you thought of the hearings, the ultimate effect in our data, at least, is that Jackson benefited from from those hearings in the, both in terms of support and in terms of perceived qualifications. Unsurprisingly, there are substantial racial differences among black respondents, 86% support her, her confirmation, that's 76% among Hispanic and 71% of those of other races and 59% among whites. So majority support in all of the racial categories and quite large support, uh, really in all 59 support in any group these days nationally is, is a pretty strong support among white respondents. There's also a bit of a gender effect. 69% of women versus 61% of men support her confirmation. Um, and ideology is interesting because, of course, liberal conservative divides are one of the ways we talk about the court and the divisions on it and the consequences of it. Here, among people who describe themselves as very conservative, 27% support her nomination, 72% oppose it. But among those who say they are somewhat conservative, it's a near even split, 45 support, 54 opposed. And among moderates, it's 69 to 30. And among liberals, it's over 90% for, for both somewhat and very liberal. So a uh, strong cro crossover, I would say, among those somewhat conservative, much less so among the very conservative, as we saw with Republicans, where it was about 29%. Uh, I'll digress for a second on that and say 29% support from Republicans for her nomination are numbers that Joe Biden would love to have <laughs> as he consistently gets about an 8% approval rating among Republicans. So in that sense, I think it shows that there is some uh, partisan crossover in support for her. There was, of course, a lot of discussion about her race and gender and the role that played in Biden's selection of her and announcement uh, ahead of time that he was going to look specifically for uh, black women who he could appoint to this position. And what effect did that have on the nomination? Well, we did an experiment embedded in the survey to test this. Without telling people what was going on, uh, at the beginning of the survey, we asked how much attention are you paying to news about the nomination? But for a random half of respondents, Embedded in that question, we simply described how much attention are you paying to the nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson, who is nominated to be the first black woman on the Supreme Court. The other random half described her as nominated to replace Justice Stephen Breyer on the Supreme Court. So one mentions race and gender, the other doesn't mention it at all, but in both cases, it's a perfectly seamless kind of treatment. Um, and what we find is a small increase in support for her among those where race and gender were mentioned. She's supported by 69% of those where race and gender were mentioned, and by 62% where that was not mentioned. So it turns out this uh, statistical effect is not quite statistically significant, so yeah, maybe. Maybe it has an effect, maybe it doesn't. But one thing is clear, mentioning it did not lower her support. If anything, it increased it, and it probably did, but not quite at the 
probability of 0.05 level that uh, is statistically significant. When we asked about perceived qualifications, there was a smaller difference by this mention. The percent rating her very qualified was 47% when race and gender were mentioned, but 45%, two points lower when not mentioned. And at the opposite end of the scale, 9% said she was not qualified when race and gender was mentioned, but that was a little higher, 14% when it was not mentioned. So what are the effects of race and gender? Well, as political rhetoric, that was something we heard a fair bit about early in the nomination process. But I think the data here make it fairly clear that those effects are, if anything, a little bit positive and not negative when we measure those effects, at least using the experiment that we did. It's probably galling to the justices that they will be the best known of their careers at the time they're nominated because they're on TV more, the focus and the news coverage is greater at the nomination stage. Once you get to sit at the court, as Chris mentioned, just down the, not quite the block, but down the five blocks that way, um, you're, you're off in chambers and the court gets covered, but pe people, justices, tend to recede from public visibility a lot during that time. Jackson right now is at the peak of public attention and it shows in our data. At this moment, she's the best known of the nine justices plus her. Uh, six, and this may seem like a small number, 62% said they knew enough about her to give a favorable or unfavorable opinion. Uh, compared to a president, that's very low, but compared to the justices, it's quite good. As I say, the highest at this point. In January, when we asked this about all nine current justices, the next highest was Clarence Thomas at 55% with an opinion about him. And the lowest is Justice Breyer, who Jackson will be replacing if she's confirmed, who's at 21%. Uh, the Chief Justice, John Roberts, is only at 38% name recognition. So this is really a, a, a sort of reminder that for those of us that follow government all the time and follow the court in particular, uh, these may be household names in our houses, but they're not household names elsewhere. Right now, Jackson at 62% is probably near the peak of her visibility, and I'm sure her name recognition will dwindle like it dwindles for the other justices once they're on the court. But at the moment, she's at a high watermark. The favorability or the positivity to her uh, confirmation is also clear in the favorable and unfavorable ratings, where she's also the most uh, net favorable of any of the justices. 44% have a favorable view, 18% unfavorable. So that's a net plus 26 points on this. Um, the next highest net favorability is uh, Justice Sotomayor at plus 20. And uh, most of the other justices are in low single digits or single digits. So um, again, I think this just shows that Jackson at this stage of the process is still in quite a positive position on confirmation as well as on these uh, uh, personal recognition and positivity grounds. Obviously confirmations or hearings for justices have become quite, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, moments of great debate and differences of opinion. Uh, and, you know, the, the days, my days, I'm an old guy now of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where most, but not all, justices were confirmed with more than 90 Senate votes and often 99 or 100 positive votes. Those days really disappeared in the 2000s and disappeared almost completely by the 2010s. So public opinion doesn't drive Senate voting where the divide between the parties has just become so much more intense uh, when it comes to judicial confirmations. But we've been asking uh, since the 
law school's Supreme Court po poll began in 2019 about when do respondents think a senator is justified in voting against a nominee who is, we describe, who is qualified and has no ethical problems. So set that aside. Should you vote to confirm that person? Or are you justified in voting against them? Um, and again, back in the days when you got 90 plus Senate votes, many senators would say, I don't agree with them on this, that, or the other thing, but presidents should have their nominees confirmed if there's no compelling reason to vote against them. Well, we ask a pair of questions. I'm gonna focus on one of them, which is, do you think a senator would be justified or not justified in voting against a nominee simply because of the, how they believe the justice would decide cases on issues such as abortion, gun control, or affirmative action? Uh, we mean broadly policy things, but um, those are the ones we mentioned in the question. Uh, in this survey, 40% say that a senator would be justified in voting against an otherwise qualified nominee on those grounds, and 59% say they would not be justified. So even in this time of sharply polarized Senate voting, a majority of the public still say that a qualified nominee shouldn't be rejected only on those policy grounds. But it bears mention that 40% think you should not, uh, you should vote against on those grounds. Um, when we ask about it purely on party, do you think that you'd vote against, you're justified in voting against just because the president is of a different party than the senator? That support drops all the way down to 17% with 82% opposed to voting against a qualified nominee in those circumstances. Again, this is a dramatically different picture than what we actually see in Senate voting, but I do think it shows the public still sees the court in many ways as something where policy can be a legitimate consideration but purely partisan voting, not so much. Now, of course, in the real world, those two are so entangled that you can't neatly separate them. Um, but this is also a, a view that is very self-serving depending on the match between your partisanship and the partisanship of the president. And so we asked this question in uh, 2020, this was before the vacancy by, of Justice Ginsburg's seat, opened up, so it was before anybody knew that. The National I don't really need a weather bulletin, sorry about that. Um, uh, so it was before there was a vacancy. Among Republicans in that period with President Trump in the White House, 39% of Republicans said you'd be justified in voting against on policy grounds. Today, that's jumped up to 58% justified in voting against. And for Democrats in 2020, 47% said you were justified voting against on policy grounds. And today that's dropped down to 29%. So it's hardly a surprise that we want our side to win. And we think those considerations are more compelling when it's a president of our party that's made the nomination than when it's the president of the other party. But I think it's, it's worth knowing that how we see these things really is through tinted lenses, depending on our partisanship and whether those are blue lenses or um, red lenses. Um, there's also been some change over recent years in the importance that different parties, partisans assign to the court and to nominations. Throughout the Trump administration, we heard an awful lot of talk about the judges, the appointments being a really important feature of uh, President Trump's administration and the Senate's confirmation of what turned out to be three justices. But things have shifted a good bit. As of now, in this current survey, 61% of Democrats say that the nomination is very important to them compared to just 44% of Republicans. Back in 2019, again, outside of an immediate confirmation battle, it was equal. 54% of Democrats and 53% of Republicans said it was very important. And a bit earlier, Republicans tended to be 
assigning more importance than Democrats were. So I think we've seen a real shift in the importance that partisans assign that may in part be because of the growing majority of justices appointed by Republican presidents, now 6-3 on the court. And so you might think it's more important when you're in the minority and hence Democrats become more concerned with it while Republicans holding that 6-3 majority, maybe less so. Nonetheless, we see a pretty substantial change, I think, in the importance of the, of the, the two sides. With a 6-3 split on the court, and with Justice Breyer coming from the liberal wing of the court being replaced by what we assume is a more liberal leading Democratic nominee, we're not in reality likely to change much about the court. This is not flipping a court from 5-4 one way to 5-4 the other way. Um, still, the public sees that she might shift the court in a more liberal direction a little bit. 13% say that she would shift the court in a very liberal direction, uh, more, much more liberal. 33% say somewhat more liberal, but 45% say she won't change the court very much, which I think is probably the smart money bet on a 6-3 uh, court. And there's a small percentage, 8%, that thinks she would move the court in a conservative direction, which is a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, when we ask people about their perceptions of how the court itself has changed over the last 15 years, 19% um, say it's become much more conservative, 31% say somewhat more conservative, so that's 50 that see it as moving to the right over this time. 30% don't see very much change at all, but 17% say more liberal and 3% say much more liberal. Um, here, there's a dramatic party difference. Among Republicans, only 29% see the court as having become more conservative over the last 15 years. 33% say it hasn't changed much and 37% say the court's become more liberal over the last 15 years. Again, from a composition point of view, that seems surprising with the shift from uh, a 5-4 to a 6-3 uh, Republican appointed majority on the court, though you can certainly point out high profile cases that people might have in mind uh, where, when they're thinking about that. Think of same sex marriage or um, uh, employment discrimination questions. Among Democrats, the perception is very strong the other way. Uh, 35% say the court's gotten much more conservative, 34% somewhat more conservative. So this is a huge divide in the perceptions of the same institution undergoing the same changes of membership and deciding the same set of cases, but, but really strong differences. Part, but not all of this, is due to the way people know or do not know about the composition of the court. We consistently find somewhere around 25 or 26 percent of the public believes there's a Democratic appointed majority on the court, even though that has not been the case for a long time now, and even though recent appointments have nudged it the other direction. But fully 22 percent of Republicans say that the majority of the court is definitely appointed by Republican presidents, but that number is 33% among Democrats and 20% among independents. Among Republicans, 29% think there's a Democratic majority on the court, and that's a bit lower, 23% among Democrats. But there is this consistent lack of understanding of who the membership is and how that might have changed over time. And it does have some real consequences for how people perceive the court. So if you look just at Republicans, those who think there's a Democratic majority, 18% think the court's gotten more conservative, but 51% think the court's gotten more liberal. But among Republicans who know correctly that there's a Republican majority, it's 34 more conservative, though it's still 31% who see it as 
becoming more liberal over time. On Democrats, there's also a difference. Among Democrats who think there's a Democratic majority, 56% see it getting more conservative. But among those who know there's a Republican majority, it's 74% seeing it more conservative. So these are big differences that stem, at least in part, from how well people understand the makeup of the court and how that's changed over time. And it's fair to say that while a few of us wake up in the morning and check the headlines for news from the court, for most people, they encounter news about the court incidentally when something big happens, when a vacancy occurs and there's a nomination or there's a big decision rendered or a big case heard. That said, and despite these levels of uncertain information about the court, over time we have seen a consistent shift in the public at large of believing the court, if you ask, how would you describe the court? Very conservative, somewhat conservative, moderate, somewhat liberal, very liberal. There, there has been a clear shift on that question. Back in 2019, 38% rated the court as either very or somewhat conservative. Mostly they chose somewhat conservative rather than very, but I'm gonna put those two, two, two categories together. And that was at 35% in 2020, just before Ginsburg died. But then it bumped up to 50% last summer after Justice Barrett was appointed, making it a 6-3 court, and I think the public opinion shifted in a plausible way there, and then 51 and 51, and this year in January, 54%, and in this latest survey, 52% see it as a conservative. So, you know, that's a 12 to 15 point shift in perception of the court at a time when its membership changed and when the types of cases that they're facing right now matter. Finally, there is, again, this difference in the um, perception of the court, depending on who you believe holds the majority of the justices. Among those who think there's still a Democratic majority, 32% call the court conservative. Among those who know the Republican majority, that's 60%. So we're looking at a 28-point difference in response in the views there depending on this bit of information. Um, we talk a lot about the legitimacy of the court, how much people trust the court. When we ask a question of the presidency, the Congress and uh, the courts, which do you trust the most? The court almost always wins out on that. In part, that's because nobody trusts Congress, right? Um, but, uh, the court is routinely in these questions from us and from others, the most trusted branch. We have found in our polling a little nuance in that. When <coughs> um, Donald Trump was in the White House, Republicans trusted the presidency most and Democrats trusted the court the most. With Joe Biden in the White House, those numbers flip, and now it's Democrats who trust the presidency and Republicans who trust the court more. And so I think part of this finding that the court is the most trusted branch does rest on a certain artifact that people will trust a president of their party a lot, but as soon as the other party is in the presidency, they turn to the court as the thing that they trust more. Um, we also ask approval of the court, and there we have seen a, an important shift. In 2020, 66% approved of the job the court is doing. That fell to 60% in 2021 in last July, but then dropped precipitously to 49% in September, and then 54, 52, and in this latest poll, 54. So it's recovered a little bit. That interval between June, July and September is when the court issued several pretty controversial issues and for the first time dealt with the Texas abortion law, um, which got a lot of attention in the sort of public media sense of getting a lot of attention. And that's where we saw that real shift. So as of now, 
54% approval is still a good bit better than Joe Biden gets at 54% in our polling. Um, but it's not the stellar ratings of the court that we were seeing in the 60s just a couple of years ago. I think this is probably predictable as the court starts accepting and dealing with real hot button issues on abortion, affirmative action, gun rights, religious liberty rights. All of these are things that are recipes for a more partisan and polarized view of the court. And almost surely that pulls down support for the court uh, in important ways. Um, but that said, at the moment, Views of the court are not as polarized as views of the president are, for example. In these latest data among Republicans, 64% approve of the court, but 34% disapprove. Among independents, it's 51-48, and among Democrats, 52-48. So those are not the kind of 90 to 10 splits that we're used to seeing by party on presidential approval or even on some of the issues that are before the court, which we'll get to in a second. So in this sense, approval of the court is oddly enough a less polarizing issue, though when we ask about abortion or gun rights or other things, then we'll see the sort of more partisan polarization that we might expect. Um, and so let me wrap up with that and open it up to questions you might have. Um, so we've, we routinely ask about cases that are pending before the court that will be decided almost surely sometime either this summer or in a few cases, these are cases that are accepted for argument next year. Um, but the first is of course, Roe versus Wade. And we ask whether uh, the respondent would like to see, would favor a decision striking down Roe versus Wade the, and thus striking down uh, the decision that made abortion legal. 50, or sorry, 32% favor that, 68% oppose it. Uh, in September, it was 28 to 72. So a four point difference. I don't think that's a lot of difference in a poll with a four point margin of error, but, and there's not a clear trend on this. This is in keeping with other polling that shows on the issue of Roe, uh, substantial somewhere between two thirds and three quarters in most polls would say, do not strike down Roe. However, in our polling, we didn't ask you the question this time, but in January we did. We asked about the case that is pending before the court for this term, and that's the Mississippi law that bans abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. And there it's a pretty even split. We had a slight majority favoring that in one poll and a slight majority opposing that in the next poll. Not much of a trend, and I think an even split is sort of the way to think about it. And so you simultaneously have two thirds to three quarters would uphold Roe versus Wade and yet would accept a considerable tightening of the window in which abortion was an option. We also asked in that earlier poll about Texas's law, which bans abortions after six weeks. And there it's over 70% opposed to that law. So my takeaway from this is that it's so easy to see abortion as purely a black and white issue, but when we look at polling, not just our polling, but going back to the 70s, really, people are very sensitive to the circumstances in which abortion should be legal or not legal. And Roe versus Wade with a right to an abortion is not something people want to strike down. But accepting a limitation after 15 weeks is something that it's part, pretty much an even split. But a restriction after just six weeks, most people are opposed to. So this is, I think, an important thing to remember as we look at these debates. Um, second issue we asked about is uh, the consideration of, of race in college admissions. And this is an issue that has been um, 
lopsided in public opinion, even as the court now for several decades has continued to uphold some consideration of race, at least as one factor in admissions. Um, but for us, we asked, uh, would you favor or oppose a court ruling that colleges cannot use race as one of several factors in deciding which applicants to admit? 81% favor that ruling, striking down that use of race or consideration of race. Just 19% oppose it. I'm sorry, I misread that. That's from September. This time in, in March, it's 75% favor, 25% opposed. And here it's across the board by party. 89% of Republicans would end the use of race, but so would 76% of independents and even 58% of Democrats. So this is an example where opinion is very lopsided and it cuts across party lines. It also cuts across racial lines in this latest data set. 79% of whites would uh, favor striking that down, ending that, but so would 58% of black people and 70% of Hispanics and 81% of those of other races. And so this is a good example where public opinion runs counter to the court's existing precedents, which the court has upheld for a long time in the face of public opinion. This is not new in public opinion that this is an unpopular issue, uh, but it'll be very interesting from a academic point of view, a social science point of view to see whatever they decide, how does that fit in with this? Um, we asked also a case that they've recently accepted that involves the <clears throat> rights of religious business owners uh, uh, to, um, um, let me read you the question. Deci would you favor or oppose the courts deciding that a business owner's religious beliefs or free speech rights can justify refusing some services to gay people? And there, only 39% favor that, 61% oppose extending that religious uh, reason for uh, refusing service. And now we see the uh, <laughs> kinds of partisan splits you might normally expect on a lot of policy issues. 70% of Republicans would favor that religious protection, 39% of independents and just 14% of Democrats would. So a strong party split on that. Finally, for expanding gun rights, the court this year has for the first time in a long time accepted a direct test of the second amendment and whether the, the second amendment um, includes the right to carry a gun outside the home. The existing Supreme Court precedent is to have a gun in your home for personal protection, but has not addressed the issue of concealed carry or carry outside. This may be a surprise to a lot of people because concealed carry laws are all over the country, including recent expansions to not even require a permit or any kind of training or licensure. Um, but those are all done by state law, not as a, a ruling under the Second Amendment. So this is an important decision on the constitutional right uh, to a gun. And here, there's a strong majority that favors that right to carry a gun outside the home. We get 63% in favor, 37% opposed. And there's been very little movement on that. Uh, all of the numbers are between 63 and 67% in favor. And we see that in state polling in our Wisconsin polling as well, that uh, concealed carry rights are something that really has percolated through the society. But again, a party split on this. 90% of Republicans favor that right to a gun outside the home, 70% of independents, but only 28% of Democrats. So a pretty big split on this. So if I can wrap this up, what we're seeing is some diversity in opinion about these things. Sometimes the public agrees with existing precedent. Roe versus Wade would be a good example. But other times they disagree pretty strongly or even more strongly in the, in the uh, 
uh, race and admissions example. And sometimes they're split depending on the question, what I was saying earlier about Roe versus Wade versus the 15 week ban versus the six week ban. And all of this lies within an institution that's not super visible to the average person. And you have to work a little bit to gain more information or you're exposed to it episodically. All of that said, I'm still struck in our data that for all the misperception or lack of information, things still roughly line up the way you would think they should line up. People do perceive a shift in the court to the right. They, if we ask them about each of the nine justices as invisible as many of those justices are, liberals like the liberals on the court and dislike the conservatives on the court, even if they generally don't know a lot about them. And the same thing in reverse for conservatives liking the, those on the right in the court and not liking those on the left. And the pattern of those things amazingly lines up pretty closely to the voting alignments of the justices themselves when they decide cases. So the order of justices from the furthest left to the furthest right in court cases, decisions, actually is tolerably well measured in the perceptions of those justices by respondents, even though very few people have read a court decision anytime recently or ever will. But so in a weird sort of osmosis, we may not know a whole lot of details, but in a rough and ready way, the public does have perceptions about the justices that kind of make sense, even if the details are a little bit limited. So I'm done with these results. Uh, we'll be back in a, in a little over a month. As I said, we do these Supreme Court surveys every two months, and we should be getting some interesting decisions maybe by the May poll, but certainly by the July poll after the court term ends. So I'd be happy to take questions um, and thank you for coming. You're in the front row, I'm gonna call on you. <laughs> you briefly sort of touched on the, the, uh, the long-term uh, approval rating of the court. Yeah. I think you, right. you actually had gone back to the 1960s. Mm -hmm. If I'm not, not mistaken, you know, when, when always been done of the overall attitudes of, of either Congress or the presidency or, or the federal government. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, you saw some fairly high numbers yeah. in terms of uh, approval ratings of the federal government. And, yeah. and over the, over time, those have degraded. I think that, if, I, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, it's gone, gone from like 80% approvals yeah. down into the, into the mid 30s. Right. Uh, and I think a lot of that is due to you know, sort of a, a series of, or an episodes of, of, of turmoil, mm -hmm. whether it's race relations in the 60s, uh, the Vietnam War in the 60s, yeah. Watergate in yeah. the 70s, have all sort of led to a, uh, to a, a degradation of approval rates of, right. of, of the federal government. Uh, interesting, what's been the trend for the court? One right. would assume, because yeah. the court is not as visible as, as your results certainly show, yeah. That it would be it would it would be higher than the federal government, but I'm wondering if if there is a degradation yeah. of the overall approval rate or at least right. perception uh, of the court during the same period yeah. of time. So if if those of you out on this on the live stream couldn't hear that, the question is uh, support or approval for the federal government has declined over the last fifty or sixty years. How's the court compared to that? You're absolutely right on the. One benchmark question is how, how much of the time can you trust the federal government to do the right thing? Always some of the time, only some of the time. Sometime about the late 70s, early 80s, pollsters had to add a category for never trust the government because so many people were volunteering in the survey that only some of the time was too much. They wanted a never answer. And that really is one of the most striking long-term trends in American politics, the collapse of confidence in the federal government. The court had been relatively insulated from that. 
So that, you know, let's not kid ourselves. The court was a pretty controversial body in the 1950s and 60s. This is not a new development that they deal with hot button issues. But on issues of trust or confidence in the court, that still held up in the 60s and 70 percent range through most of this time that the federal government was falling a lot. And presidents sort of waxed and waned from individual presidents. Now we're in an era where presidents are generally in the low, low to mid 40s is kind of the new normal for presidents when the low to mid 50s might have been the sort of normal in earlier years. This substantial drop we saw from 2019 to summer of 21, and then another really big drop at the end of the summer, I think comes back to the question of the court as a more politicized body. And part of that surely goes to the fights over previous confirmations. It goes to the Merritt Garland nomination that you know was, was blocked. Um, and then a series of three appointments by President Trump. Uh, but now I think the issues before the court are also increasing the polarization. Having said that, I pointed out that the party splits are not as deep as they might be. So what happens if those party splits do start to erode? Democrats, I mentioned, were 52 approved, 48 disapproved. You could easily imagine that approval rating going way down. Earlier in the year, Democrats were in the low 40s, actually. Um, so I do think there's room here for the court to go way down. There's a, the famous quote from the Federalist Papers that the Supreme Court has neither the purse nor the sword. And so its power is the power to get others to willingly uh, accept their rulings. And in this much more partisan era, might we see more at least conflict over decisions and perhaps an unwillingness to accept those decisions? I mean, there are always going to be challenges and appeals and new cases. So that's that's normal and not not new. But if we lose confidence in this last institution that has done pretty well, um, all those problems you mentioned about overall confidence in the government may exacerbate our problems when we don't have the court either. Um, yeah. Yes. Have you been polling on court packing decisions? Yes. Uh, the question is, have we called on court packing? Um, we've asked several questions on the broader court reform. Um, so term limits for justices is wildly popular up in the 60 to low 70s favor term limits. Now, we didn't say how long those terms would be or exactly how that would work or how you would have managed the Constitution, which implies strongly appointment for life. But set aside those kinds of arguments, there really is strong support for limited terms for, for justices. But when we ask about expanding the size of the court, a majority oppose that expansion, though support is in the 40%, 40 to 45% range on expansion. Um, and we've also asked a question about restricting the jurisdiction of the court, because there has been discussion that Congress could change the jurisdiction of the court by law, say you cannot rule on this kind of issue. And we've also asked about judicial review of decisions and people overall pretty strongly support judicial review continuing and they oppose restricting the jurisdiction. So if you look at that, the one thing that would be seemingly impossible to do under the constitution term limits, eh, no, massive, op you know, massive support for it, but really you couldn't do it without a almost surely an amendment to the Constitution. The thing that would technically be easy, in air quotes here, would be expanding the size of the court. That is just a matter of legislation. But despite all the debate about it, the public at large was not convinced by the arguments for expansion. And even among Democrats, 
um, support for expansion was fairly tepid, just a bit of a majority, never a really substantial majority. So we went through the presidential commission on the court and variety of recommendations and actually really good history of some of the issues were presented by that commission. But I see little movement on the public to expand the court at this point. Um, and as I say, I think that's the most probable thing that you could imagine actually doing. Chris? We had a question come through on the live stream wondering if you have in the past or anticipate asking any questions uh, related to kind of maybe future retirements of justices, should justices retire, mm -hmm. and kind of what yeah. a, a prospective future nominee yeah. might be attractive to certain Oh, that's a, that's a great topic. I'm glad whoever that was out there asked that. Uh, we did ask about Justice Breyer uh, back last summer, and we did another experiment on this about whether we explained in the question his age and the issue of appointing a replacement by a Democratic president while Democrats controlled the Senate. Um, and what we found was that most people, a pretty substantial majority, did not favor strategic timing of retirements. And even when we explained the consequences, you know, sort of what was at stake, in effect, what was the argument for him retiring, that still didn't become a substantial majority. I think part of this goes back to this idea that People still, for all of these things, don't really want to see the court in purely partisan terms or as purely political action. And so at the time when some folks were very vociferous about Breyer needing to retire, but when he was still saying, I'll do it when I want to, um, the public by and large was with Breyer on that and didn't want strategic timing of retirement. Um, we've not asked anything about what kind of new justices would you like to see on the court. Um, you know, we've, uh, as it happens, we have not been doing surveys at the moments that the previous vacancies occurred. We finished our 2020 poll literally the day before Justice Ginsburg died. Um, and so we've missed seeing how people react in that case to the Barrett nomination or earlier to other nominations. Okay, I wanna thank you for being here. I appreciate it very much. And thank you for following on the live stream out there. And uh, I think we'll call it a day. Thank you so much.